Well, if you look and see the outline that I've given you, <coughs> excuse me, first five verses are talking about himself as a servant, as an apostle, as <coughs> his story about the gospel of Christ and what he's doing. He's wanting to go and produce faith. He is wanting to help the Romans, the Christians in Rome, and to impart unto them some spiritual gift. Paul, being an apostle, has that ability to lay on, lay the hands on someone and give them the gift. Remember as he wrote to Timothy, he says, I, I, <clears throat> I'm asking you not to forget that which is within you. That which I imparted unto you. Now we're not really sure what that gift was. There's gift of knowledge, gift of miracles, gift of interpretation, so forth. But whatever Timothy needed, Paul gave to him as a young evangelist. <clears throat> so I want to start now <clears throat> with a second section <clears throat> concerning the Romans uh, themselves. I love Paul's attitude. Look, let's look at several things right quick. Look at verse 8. First, I thank God. Anytime an individual in writing has a phrase and he uses it several times, I think it's something to take notice. Uh, and we'll talk about that moment in a moment. But then verse 11. For I long to see you. Now, he's not personally pushing himself. He's not saying, look at me what I've done. He's pointing at them, encouraging them, challenging them. And so this stands out. Then in verse 14, I am debtor. You know, if you and I ever forget what we have received through the forgiveness of Christ, what His blood has done for us, the fellowship that we enjoy as brethren, if we ever forget that cleansing that we have in Christ Jesus, we've, we've left it. We've lost it. Never forget what He's done for you, that you were purged from your sins. So He says, I am debtor. And because of Christ appearing to Him on the road to Damascus, told Him to go into uh, where He would be told what He must do, and... Saul became Paul. Saul is the <clears throat> Jewish name. Paul is the Gentile name, Roman name. Somewhere along the line, I think we emphasize that Paul had somehow gained <laughs> citizenship as a Roman. This is what has enabled him to uh, make an appeal to Caesar. If he had not that power, <laughs> the Jews would have did him in long time before this. Remember the men who vowed that they would see Paul uh, dead? Well, because he appealed to Caesar, the Romans escorted him. Remember, even on the ship that, that sank, there was this Roman guard that was with him. Uh, and because of that, he made it to Rome safely. And there, maybe two years before something happened. But he had something on his mind. I have a debt. You know, you and I, we sign on the dotted line on a loan, and that debt wears us out until we get the title, or until we get the, the last payment with the mark paid in full. Well, we never will have that happen to us in our Christianity. We'll always have a debt. I owe Jesus. I'm responsible to Him. Then in verse 16, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Here we have several things that, that 
point to the heart of this man that's writing this epistle. It doesn't sound like someone who is uh, hung on himself. He, he's not, uh, he's humble. He's the great missionary. Three missionary journeys going and, and converting and establishing congregations all over Asia Minor and uh, there in Palestine. And now he'll help the church in Rome. Look at verse 6 and 7. Let's see the description that, that he has about them. <clears throat> now, how could he have a description about them when he hasn't even seen them face to face? Well, he's obviously heard about them. Yes, and that's what he's going to say. I've heard, your faith has been made known, and he's, he's kind of bragging on him, isn't he? <coughs> well, I don't know, I like the word brag, but he's complimenting <laughs> them. He's saying, good job. Your faith has, the way you've lived, the way you've uh, followed Christ, you've set the example, and it's been seen by others. Verse 6, among whom you are also the called of Jesus. Called to be. It's a possession. You look at 1 Corinthians 6 and you see that. That we're bought with a price. We are not our own. We are, we belong to Him. Verse 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That word called, He's already used it once. He's used it in, in reference to Himself. He's called an apostle. He is set for the task of preaching the gospel. He has a message. He is a sent one. <clears throat> like the other twelve. Called uh, afterwards. The only reason he could be an apostle. Is because he witnessed or saw Jesus on, on uh, the road to Damascus. What is the word saint? Called to be saints. Does that mean, you know, <clears throat> there, there's many saints that, that have been known. Saint Christopher. Saint, anybody else have an example? Michael. Saint Michael. Benedict. <laughs> You're not talking about Benedict Arnold, are you? <laughs> All right. Now, <clears throat> in the Roman church, there are certain requirements that historic individuals have to have performed in their life in order to be called a saint. Pete, do you, do you know anything about that? I, think they, I don't know if they have to perform a miracle or see a miracle. Okay. But now that, that's impossible. Because they have <coughs> seen nowadays saints. Right. Well, do you want people to determine whether you are a saint or do you want God to determine you are a saint? God, of course. God, yeah. We are called to be saints. That's a Christian. Look at uh, 2 Peter. I have to turn that air conditioner down a little bit. I put it on 65, is that okay? No, I didn't. I'm teasing. <clears throat> Let's see here. We're at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> On 
All right, I have a little confusion here. I thought I was going to look up the word saint, but the same thing here is priest. Uh, and it's, it's giving us the distinction that we ought to be as Christians. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Another version says, people for God's own possession. That is, I, I believe, a better description because that's what it means. We're, we're bought with a price. We're not our own. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Go ahead. It says, To the church of God, which is at current, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Goes with it, doesn't it? Yes. What's that for? And then back to verse 9. That you should show forth the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So, so we're called out of darkness. What does darkness represent? Sin. Sin. A sinful life. Being worldly. We're called from the old man to become a new man or old woman. <laughs> new woman, okay? Sometimes it's good to... You know, anthropos is mankind. If you want to be uh, specific, then there are names for man and there's names in Greek for a woman. And... You can go into that study, but <laughs> so what do you think a saint is? Christian. Christian? Does that mean I'm perfect? We don't reach for perfection being sinless. We are reaching for maturity completeness when I was a child I spoke like a child I felt like a child but when I became a man I put away childish things here is that perfection this maturity that all Christians should reach for and then the, the second part of verse 7 his standard uh, greeting, peace and a grace to you from our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, grace is Jesus Christ. Christ came to this earth to show us grace. And we have, as a result of that, His peace. To His disciples, He said, Peace I leave with you. And he's asking them to show peace to others. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. But what do you think uh, that does for these readers of this epistle? I'm praying for you. Not just once, but unceasingly. <coughs> I love it when I hear my African brethren. I'm praying for you. Just this morning, one of them said, I'm praying for you. And I said, I need all the prayers I can get, brother. Thank you. Encouragement. It's encouragement, isn't it? When we bring someone's name before the throne of God, that's a privilege and that's a determination to depend on God. God is the great giver. How does He give? As He wishes. And we, we allow that to happen because we can't control them, of course. But we are to bring these things with all supplication of prayers and, and uh, good wishes. 
So here verse 8 and 9, he's saying, I thank God for you. When's the last time you said to, to a brother or sister in Christ, you know, I'm happy about you. I'm glad we're brethren together. I'm, I'm glad we have fellowship one together. When we have that, that commonness, that unity. Uh, <clears throat> remember what Jude said, you know, I, I determined to talk to you about our common faith. But then he says, but it's necessary for me to contend earnestly for the faith. So he really accomplished both, didn't he? By mentioning it, he's telling them, I'm thankful for our common faith together. Let's never forget it. And it's never, let's not quit expressing that to one another. I'm glad you are a Christian. I'm glad you're my brother and sister in Christ. Now what happens if I see you Sunday morning and I express that to you and there's nothing through the week. No communication. No email. No, no text. No messages. Do we, do we talk with each other? Do we communicate? Now I know there, there are certain groups, you know, that, you know, uh, <coughs> That, that uh, talk among yourselves, that's great. But what about that person who may not have someone? Look around, take notice, and communicate. Take the initiative to talk to someone you haven't talked to before or a long time. Let's don't take each other for granted. You know what, what happens when we do that? People fall through the cracks. And, and all of a sudden, someone that's been attending is gone. But where's so and so? They hadn't been here in so long. Well, I don't know what happened to them. Does that happen? Has it, David? Had it? Yeah. To our misfortune. Because anyone that's lost back to the world is our loss and a greater loss for them. Then in verse 9 and 10, Paul's desire to visit them. Now, I've, I've said this so many times, you're tired of it, but, you know, it took two years before I could go back to Uganda. Well, they kept telling me, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? We long to see you. And I finally was able to say, you know what, I'm going to be there April the 3rd, or I'm coming that way. And, and that was the best two weeks. I enjoyed it so much. And the, the students they just said, you know, that was fantastic having you here with us. But, you know, communication still is going on, even with Facebook and so forth. But he says, I long to see you. Verse 11, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. You know, I think that's one of the words I ask you to underline. What does it mean to be established? Um, He uses it again in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Uh, to be established. Well, it's not rules that we set up. He's talking about establishing them in, in the faith. Yes. Whatever spiritual gift he's going to give them, 
or gifts that's going to help establish them in the faith. So, what do you think that word means? Yes, David. I'll give you an example that back in the 60s and early 70s, there was this word went around called the establishment. Speak just a little higher. The establishment. Have you ever heard that term used for the government? Yeah. The establishment. They're established in the government. They can't be moved. They're established. It's an establishment. Uh, they're set there in concrete. They're set there. <laughs> they can't move. Yeah. And uh, that was a term that went around in the 60s. And uh, I can remember the term of people saying, we got to break the establishment. We have to break that establishment. It's kind of like I see establishment. It's like you build a building. This building here has a lot of boards in it. Once you build a wall, you set a board in place, that board's established in that place, it's going to be there until you tear it down. So it's established. It's, it's set. It's not going to move until you, until you move it. But that's what he's wanting for them. He's wanting them to be established uh, in place. He wants them to be set in place. It's kind of like the setting. Once that foundation is set, it's, it's there. It's established. That's right. Good point. Look at Romans 10, 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. You know, Wednesday night we started studying about which covenant do we go by. And the law of Moses has been taken away. And Brandon came up with Hebrews chapter 8 about it being uh, what was the word? Obsolete. Obsolete. Uh, so we understand that. So we are established in the first covenant. The covenant of Christ. His teaching. His doctrine. We admire. We appreciate the many people that live in the Old Testament. We've learned from that. Romans 15 verse 4. But we are governed by the New Testament. So there's another side of that word, established. He, want, he put us into the faith. There is two faiths, two, two aspects of the word faith. There is having faith that causes me to act. That's believing. That's one of the prerequisites of our salvation. I, be, I begin by hearing, and then I believe, and then I go on to action, and I <sighs> repent and I'm baptized. Well, there's the faith. That's, that's where uh, Jude says in verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith. The faith that represents the whole picture of Christianity. Of, of why we're here, what we're doing, and I believe that's a, it's established by Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? So once again, verse 11, I long to see you but what's his purpose? That he may impart unto them some spiritual gift so that you may be established. What, what were the spiritual gifts? Speaking in tongues, prophesying. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14 deal with that. 14 shows the end of those gifts, but Mark 16, it tells us that those mighty wonders and works and miracles was to confirm the Word. Now, if we didn't have the Bible today, let, let's just put ourselves back in that first century. We don't have Matthew through Revelation. All we have is 
the other scriptures that talk about the coming Christ. And then all of a sudden, there's inspiration. And men receive the words of God. And they start speaking this teaching of Christ. What, what's going to convince the majority of people that it's true? What was one of the things that convinced people that Jesus was who He was? Miracles. Miracles. No one does these things. You are the Christ. And so it was given to the possibility, excuse me, it was the possibility was given to these men to perform miracles which hadn't been seen except through Christ. And now what they're preaching is true because of what they're doing with these miraculous gifts. An affirmation of the gospel. That's right. It affirms the truthfulness of their words because of that stamp of approval by this miracle. The supernatural things that were taking place by the hands of men. Now, are those, th are those things available today? No. Because we have the perfect law of liberty. When we have complete revelation, it, done, it did away with the need for all this miracles. I liked what, I think it was Roy Deaver who explained uh, what the miracles were like. When you're building a building and you have a scaffolding to erect the structure, the skeleton, and then finally the outer uh, appearance of a building, what happens to the scaffolding that people use to climb up and, and nail the boards and the, and the covering and lay the bricks? and No what, longer any need. No need for. It. In fact, if you left that scaffolding, wouldn't it be kind of a, a mar? It, it distract from the beauty of the building you you built. Yeah, that's what the miracles were. A scaffolding till that which was perfect was given, and that's the church and the uh, what Jesus established and promised look at it, the miracles were, though they were perfect in their happening and they were real, the miracles were not, it was not a completed building, it was not a completed uh, uh, perfect substance because it was just being put together with miracles. It wasn't, it wasn't a completion, it wasn't, you know, and that's what a lot of people have trouble with. A lot of people think that, well, would miracles be better? Not necessarily. Okay. Because it would left us incomplete without the fullness of God's Word. Well, look at the, the beginning of that church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. After it gives us the seven ones, we've, you've heard me teach on the, the one body, one spirit, one hope, Lord, faith, baptism, one God. Then he showed, verse 11, and he gave some, or he, he gave this, uh, this office, different offices for the establishment of faith. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. What was the purpose of that? For the perfecting of the saints... For edifying of the body of Christ. Oh, excuse me. For the work of the ministry and for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and all knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Did that come about? You betcha. We have the kingdom of Christ. And then lastly, uh, Paul's reason and eagerness to visit them. Verse 11, 
through 15. Underline it, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me, until I own it, until it's me, it's not mutual. You might be strong in your faith, but until each member is strong, we can't really call it mutual. Now, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was hindered, that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among other Gentiles. I am dead of both the Greeks and the barbarians, both the wise and unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. A while ago, I could have used that. I'm eager, you know. I am debtor. Uh, all these statements, I, I'm ready to come to you. I'm debtor. I'm eager. Or he says in King James, I am ready to preach the gospel uh, to you at Rome also. And let's look at that last verse and we'll stop. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What could cause anybody to be ashamed? The way they're treated when they present something. All right. The way people are treated. Now, can you do anything about the way people treat you? That's on them. I hope we're never put to shame because someone thinks little of us. Because it condemns sin and most people enjoy sinning. And they don't want to be, they don't like what they're doing to be condemned. That's probably the main thing. All right. If, if my private thoughts was all of a sudden announced, came over the PA system. I'd shrink sometimes. You know what? Oops. I don't want you to hear that. You know, we, we hide things until we get control of them. Secret things are going to be announced one day from the housetop. I, I think many of us are going to be ashamed. We're going to cringe. I don't want you to know I did that. But aren't we all in the same boat? We all have thoughts. We all have action. We all... We're human. And we just keep working at it day by day. But he's saying here, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Are you a Christian? Don't let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody mock you, ridicule you. Stand up for your faith. Yeah, I believe that. I believe in the one church. I believe in salvation. I believe there's wrong ways. And you back it up with verse, scripture. Let's be confident who we are and who we belong to. Not because of something we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. We'll close. We'll start there next time. Appreciate you.